To the Microsoft Podcasting World Headquarters. All right. We're in build, Building 18 on the Microsoft campus. We're live on Channel 9 and on the podcast. Excellent. I'm Michael Lehman, Channel 9 podcast producer and deep voiced guy. Yeah. I always wondered where that voice came from. So, this is what it looks like when you're doing those podcasts. This is, huh? what, this is what it looks like. This is what I see on the screen when I'm podcasting. <laughs> Baby, let's see that. Nice. Well, this is a, uh, a song that I wrote and produced about a year ago called Good, the podcasting song. It's inspired by a, a, um, a program I saw on PBS, and having a music studio at my house was actually one of the things that led me into the podcasting business in the first place. Interesting. You know, I've, I've known Dave Weiner for almost 20 years, and I was reading his blog, and I heard him start talking about this podcasting thing. This was in October of 2004. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, I said, wait a minute, I've got a recording studio at my house, I've got all this original music, and I've got the deep voice when I want to use it, so yeah. I should do this podcasting thing. So I started doing it, and it turns out I was like the 12th podcaster in the whole world. So you're podcasting right now. I'm podcasting right now. So this is what that, so this is what podcasting looks like. This is what podcasting looks like here at the Microsoft World Podcasting Headquarters. Yes. Fantastic. All kinds of people do it, you know, from the point of view of uh, portable devices. I actually have one that I've taken around PDC, and I'm going to be car carrying around at Mix 06. Okay. Which is in uh, Vegas next month, the 20th through 22nd of March. Yep. Doing more, you know, geek on the street interviews. Excellent. And. Uh, so it's, it's really just a matter of recording the audio, putting a little music behind it if you want to. I've got a setup where I can actually do telephone interviews. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most of the Mix 06 buzzcasts are done uh, via my office phone here as, as telephone things. Sure. Now, RSS obviously plays a big role in the, in the transport mechanism. Yes. To get the files in enclosures to iPods and... Windows Media Player everything. and anything, right. Well, at, at one point in time, uh, Dave Weiner had a certain version of RSS, and Netscape had another version of something that they called RSFs, which meant something different to them, stood for RDF syndication format or something, and the two of them sat down and beat heads up one day and kind of agreed on a compatible subset, and that, that RSS not only has the item concept in it where, the, where blog entries come from, it also has an enclosure item so that you can deliver in the case of podcasting, an MP3 or a WMA or an M4A or whatever kind of audio file you want to use. So it uses the RSS enclosure mechanism to deliver those files. So what, I mean, what's so exciting about listening to someone talk? I mean, well, what, why are podcasts so interesting? Well, one of the things is, first of all, you can express an emotion. You know, when I get excited about something, I can get really excited and you can hear that. And we can see it. That's too, right. Well, today we can it. see it, right. Okay. But one of the other things is that I can do something else while I'm listening to a podcast. I can drive in the car, I can work out at the gym, I can go for a run. To me, that's the, the second biggest thing about podcasting is it only uses one sense, so you can, you're free to do something else. And, you know, there's an awful lot of things that you can do, like commuting and so forth, uh, and listen to the podcast at the same time, same as you can with the radio. Mm -hmm. The big difference is you can listen when you want to, and you can be very selective about which ones you want to download. You know, I used to listen to Adam Curry's Daily Source Code every day. I don't do it quite so often anymore. Some people love Don and Drew. Some people like, we've got a guy here at Microsoft uh, who goes by the, the, the podcast handle of Major Nelson, mm. who's in the Xbox group who does a podcast about, about gaming. Okay. 
And so and you would, also have a, a podcast. Yeah, I've, I've got a personal podcast that's called Mike's Manic Minute. Nice. And one of the things that I, I discovered at the third blogger con, which is a year ago, November, was that some of the shit just ran on way, way too long. And by the <laughs> middle of it, I was going. So I said, wait a minute, I've got this really cool plugin in my music production software that will allow me to uh, time compress without pitch changing. So I don't sound like the chipmunks, but I can actually record something that's up to about a minute and a half and crunch it down and still make it uh, intelligible. Kind of like the Micro Machines guy, except I don't actually have to talk that fast. Interesting. And so uh, Mike's Manic Minute is always one minute long, and it's usually a couple of news stories and a recommendation for somebody else's podcast. And I do it nearly daily, mm -hmm. as often as I can do it. And, and that's what I did pretty much exclusively for the first nine months. Uh, and then uh, I joined uh, this team I'm on here at Microsoft up here in, in Redmond uh, about ten months ago mm -hmm. and I uh, got uh, engaged with the group that was putting on a professional developers conference. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing podcasts on Channel 9. The, the PDC Buzzcast was the first one of those. And so I went from being just an amateur podcaster because I loved it to essentially a professional podcaster because now I do it as part of my job. Excellent. And so I not only uh, build the uh, record the podcast, I interview people fairly often, I also mm -hmm. write uh, musical themes for some of the other podcasts that I do for Channel 9 and also some that I'm doing for some uh, future things we're doing here at Microsoft. So it allows me to engage all these things that I really love to do mm -hmm. and then I, when I'm all done with that I do a little audio post-production if I decide that that I've said something really stupid I can go edit that out. Uh, oftentimes when I'm doing interviews with people on product teams I have to cut something out if somebody says no we're not ready to announce that yet Mm -hmm. And I always tell people if they really screw up, just pause and say over what they want to say again because I can cut that out as well. But for the most part, I really don't do much, much post-production because part of podcasting is that it's this really natural format. It's, it's like, hi, just like Channel 9, you know. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? You talk, and it's great, and you're done. Yes. Now, um, let's talk briefly about what it takes to make a podcast. Like, I see you have a rather nice... Rather large microphone. Yes, you have, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, you a good have, quality microphone is always a really good thing to have. And uh, you have a mixing board. I've got a, a, a small mixing board so that I can bring in various sources. Mm -hmm. And I've also got. Uh, I use Cakewalk Sonar as my music production program. It's a multi-track thing, like Pro Tools, like GarageBand, uh, that basically allows me to put music tracks, music on one track, and and the audio on another track, and then mix the whole thing down to a uh, a polished, you know, thing in the end, and then I convert it into MP3 and convert it into WMA and and uh, put it up on Channel Nine for the Channel Nine podcast, which is actually a really simple thing to do. So uh, let's talk about that for how hard is it to make a podcast for Channel Nine? Um, it's really easy. It basically just have to figure out what do you want the theme of the show to be. I mean, I do I produce shows for other people who are also on Channel Nine, uh, Red Hills IIS show. I'm producing right now a series of Mix 06 Buzzcasts with Jennifer Ritzinger. Um, I'm producing a series called the Micro ISV Show, which is me interviewing one of my other constituencies, which is uh, little guys that have one to three or four person software companies that don't have any VC funding that are out there doing it on their own. Okay. Because that's part of what, you know, my, my podcasting thing is part of my whole big job as a technical evangelist, which is to reach out to customers and make real human connections with them and work with them on what their real pain points are and connect them with our product groups who are desperately interested in what a real customer thinks. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, definition of a technical evangelist. Can you elaborate on a little bit and how that differentiates uh, yourself from marketing? What's the yeah, difference yeah. between what you just said and somebody in marketing? The difference between technical evangelism and marketing, first of all, is that it's technical which means that you know I've been a, a software developer for 36 years, you know, starting back in the days when I always say when you had to punch a hole in something to, <laughs> to, uh, to write your code. And hopefully it wasn't the wall. Usually it was a punch card or a paper tape or something. But so I, you have to really understand what it is the people that you're connecting with do. You have to be able to understand the technical aspects of the product to be able to talk to the product groups. But you also have to have a whole set of social skills and business skills so that you can interact with the customers and understand things from their point of view. So really, it's, a, it's one of these kind of gestalt jobs where you have to have both of those kind of skills. And in fact, you know, having been around for so long, I've done uh, you know, 20, 30 years of consulting for the most part. I mean, I go back to a time before there was a Microsoft. And uh, it was only recently that I realized that after all those customer contacts, 
but I developed a certain set of social skills that would allow me to, to do this. Yeah. And this is the kind of job you can't outsource, just like you can't outsource carrying a video camera around and filming people for Channel 9. Nope, can't do that. So you can't outsource that personal touch or the physical proximity necessary to really do uh, a good a good thing at, at evangelism. So it's really, I mean, I got into this business because I love helping people's, making people's lives easier, mm -hmm. and particularly developers' lives. I mean, I've been a developer tools guy all the way along, back from the first compiler that I wrote in 1970 to the Pascal compiler I wrote back in the early days of the PC business called Pascal MT Plus, to C compilers and you name it. Uh, you know, I've always been a developer tools guy. And in fact, one of the things I'm doing as part of my evangelism programming now is I'm working on a new thing called a software factory. And uh, in the next uh, coming months or so, I'm going to be doing this evangelism program, which is codenamed GlidePath, that's targeted at helping the micro ISV be successful on Windows Vista. Fantastic. So now, here's an idea for you. Why not have uh, a Michael Lehman show, or hour, or half an hour, where you're podcasting, but taking live phone calls from anybody? Well, I mean, what's, uh, so what I'm trying to get at is, uh -huh. it's basically a radio show. The only difference is, it's not live, right? And you're not admitting it via airwaves in a pretty powerful way, right? Uh, it's fundamentally time shiftable. That's one thing. Yes. Uh, and I mean, the the reason I know there's, I mean, obviously it would take some additional hardware beyond what I have to be able to do a phone-in show. There's certain uh -huh. kinds of phone connection boxes that people use to be able to get good quality output out of the phone in those interview type situations. Okay. But you know, there's there's no technical reason why I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is I, anybody doing a podcast where they get just... Phone calls? Call oh, yeah, them? yeah. I mean, okay. a lot of people do that. And uh, a lot of people also get audio comments and add, edit them in later as if it were a phone-in show. Okay. And I think Chris Perillo does some of that kind of stuff. I know that there's some guys that do a DVD weekly podcast that do some things like that. I think Leo Laporte might do that in his This Week in Tech, which is a really popular technology podcast. Fantastic. But you know, one of the other things about podcasting is because there's no barrier to entry other than just getting yourself set up. I mean, I've done a lot of, of recommendations of podcasts on my podcast of the day, part of the Manic Minute. Mm -hmm. And I've pointed off to people who are doing serialized voice reading of novels, to somebody who's focusing on trying to gather people together around uh, ADD because he has a, a child with ADD to people who are reading you know Ayurvedic horoscopes on a daily basis I mean it's all over the map comedy and so on and so forth that, that's there so it's, it's really the long tail of content uh, and some people only have five listeners but it's five people who care about what they have to say fantastic so what are some of the other uh, podcasting things going on here in the world headquarters I mean uh you mentioned Brett Hill's show, right. Micro ISV, Buzzcast. Right. Ron Jacobs does a, a Artcast. Uh, the Artcast show, mm -hmm. which the first few uh, shows of that series were produced here, and then Ron has taken that on because he also is a is a podcaster. He's been doing webcasts for a long, long time for MSDN, okay. and now he's kind of taken that on to doing his own production. But that's also on Channel Nine. Yeah. And you know the the key is. Uh, trying to find the right kind of content to have a reasonable audience. Uh, we have some, some new things coming down the road which I can't quite talk about yet, but one of them involves uh, health care and there's another uh, podcast series that I'm doing where I do some announcing, uh, the doctor does uh, some introduction, and then he has a panel discussion on the telephone using the conferencing services with a bunch of other doctors. Interesting. And so it's a way, the key thing is it's a way of being able to express emotion about things that you just simply can't get in a blog. But it's the same basic thing as a blog. You put out your opinions and, and people subscribe to it. And uh, they can also, you know, uh, comment on... Right. Right? It's a threaded discussion. Exactly. At least on Channel 9. Right. And, and on almost all, uh, all podcasting environments, they re I mean, it really starts out with blogging software. I mean, for example, for my Mike's Manic Minute, I use Radio Userland because mm -hmm. it was one of the few... Uh, blogging softwares that supported uh, RSS enclosures when I first started podcasting. But uh, I'm doing some other things where there's a company that I use called Libsyn.com where I mean, it's, it's that cheap. For Inside Microsoft we have our own hosting for people that do stuff outside. For five bucks a month mm -hmm. you can host up to 100 megabytes worth of content 
and no bandwidth charges. So it's 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 just exploding. You know, I think I was like their fourth customer or something, and now they've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So now, what about what's the publishing model for podcasts? So is it difficult to do? No, it basically amounts you produce your audio programming using whatever kind of uh -huh. tools you want. I mean, you can even do it with Sound Recorder if you want to. Okay. And you convert it into an MP3. You FTP it to wherever it is the server is going to listen, uh, live on. Mm -hmm. And then you write a blog entry, and as part of that blog entry, you put in a URL to the MP3 file and say, make this an enclosure. Press post, you're done. Excellent. I mean, one of the things that, that very frequently happens with podcasts is that people write blog entries as well mm -hmm. so that they can include links that they talk about on the show. Okay. So that people can, for example, with my Manic Minute for the podcast of the day, I always include a link to the site where that podcast is actually hosted mm -hmm. so that people can get there. But, you know, oftentimes people will hear things and they'll go, wow, I really want to find out more about that. That also makes a lot of the content searchable. Excellent. Content searchable. So can you search podcasts? The, uh, you can search the blog entries that go along with podcasts with text search, like MSN sure, search. Sure. But there's also some companies out there who will actually transcribe audio podcasts and then post them as a blog entry so that they can be text searchable. Fantastic. So I'm not sure what the status of this is. Uh, when I do the Manic Minute, I actually script the entire thing out because I want to have a minute and I can't afford to say, um, and well, you know, because yeah. it yeah. totally blow away the concept. <laughs> but for most of the ones I do for uh, Channel 9, I don't script them. I just create a short blog entry that says, I was talking to this person and there's their website and here's maybe a few related links. So um, it's, it's not a new technology in any stretch of the imagination. I mean, in the sense that it's an audio recording. It's been around for a long time. Right. I mean, I've been producing audio for 25 years. Exactly. I've been doing digital audio for almost 20 years. Precisely. So the technology, you know, is exactly the same kind of thing that has made uh, Napster and media players and things like that go. Mm -hmm. So that, that part's all easy. I mean, it, it's really just a matter of thinking about something you want to talk about, being willing to commit to the time it takes to produce it, because mm -hmm. oftentimes it takes much longer to post to produce it than it did to actually record the whole thing. Because sometimes, especially for the longer shows, you have to listen to the whole thing again yeah. that you just did and make sure that there aren't any big gaps in there. Excellent. And uh, But there are books. I've noticed that I think you're an author. Have you co-authored a, a podcasting book? No, or? I haven't. Okay. I mean, I've, I've previewed and reviewed a number of them okay. uh, back in the early days. But no, I'm not, uh, I'm not okay. an author. It's not yet. I've always had a, the... Uh, dream of writing a book, but I've been so busy with writing software, I've never written the book. Hey, Scoble can write one. Yeah, true. You can do it. There you go. So um, so what's the future of podcasting? Like, where, where would you like to see podcasting go? Well, I think there's, there's two things. I think one of them is that as a delivery mechanism, I think it has a huge uh, potential for impact, not only to the public at large, but also inside companies. I know that there are some of our competitors that are using podcasting widely inside their company, IBM being a, a particularly notable one. And I think that, that uh, you know, the, the future of, of podcasting is also going to be for dissemination of information from, you know, technical evangelists to the field, from executives to employees, from uh, sales managers to customers. I think there's an awful lot of, of potential for, again, creating something short enough to be tolerable to listen to but having the excitement and the emotion. I mean, it's like the difference between reading something written by Tony Robbins and listening to Tony Robbins deliver it. You know, in one case, you're, you know, he's in your face and you, you can just, you just get excited from watching it. You know, you can do something with the book, but it just isn't the same. I mean, you know, anybody who can deliver a, a good message can easily grasp that real easily. Okay. And, and podcasting, I think, you know, there's another aspect of, it, aspect of it, though, which is that it, everybody's trying to figure out how to monetize it. Everybody's trying to figure out, well, if this is like a radio show, then how do we do advertising? How do we do something so that I can get paid for that? Adam Curry is ex experimenting with a lot of that on his pod show uh, podcast, trying to figure out what kind of advertising thing is interesting enough without being intrusive. Because some people say, the reason I listen to podcasting is there isn't any advertising. Exactly. But, of course, on the other hand, how do you get paid for the darn thing? Uh-huh. That's a good point. So that's one of the key things that, that people are still trying to figure out figure out how to do. But I think that, that it will eventually get there. I mean, I think the key is is that it's so easy to create and produce one mm -hmm. that a lot of people are inspired to do it. 
And just like blogs, all of a sudden, if you just start getting one person talking to another person talking to another person, you know, as Scoble put in his book, people like to communicate. The whole thing that's, that's sort of fundamentally wrong with traditional PR and advertising is it's somebody shouting at you. And they shout at you a million times until you finally remember what they had to say. Mm -hmm. But it's not a conversation like we're having right here. Exactly. You know, people like to, to hear a question and an answer and, and you know, f send in their own questions. Exactly. And I certainly would invite anybody who's got a question about podcasting or about uh, the technology or whatever. I mean, this is going to be a thread on Channel 9. Uh -huh. Post your question there or my Channel 9 name is Ultra Guy. There's an email link on my profile page. Send yeah. me an email. Yeah. You know, love to have a conversation. That's the whole point. Totally. It would be nice to pod have like a real time um, where you could be podcasting and, and receive questions in real time and answer them, quote unquote, on the air. Well, uh, I mean, you know, a lot, we do that a lot here at Microsoft with our webcasts. Okay. MSDN webcasts are a lot like that. When we have a big outreach either to a group of customers or whatever. In fact, that's what uh, Robert Scoble's wife, Marion, does for a living is help produce ah. MSDN webcasts. Okay. And as part of that, they have a question thing where you can type a question in essentially to a chat window and it comes to the pe person giving the uh, presentation they can answer the question live right there. Fantastic. So, I mean, we, you know, we have that kind of technology, but podcasts pretty traditionally have not been people calling. You know, or doing that. It's, it's been more of this back and forth, just like blogging, mm -hmm. not having instant, instantly. And again, I just wanted to point out that this this is a podcast and a video right. at the same time. Exactly. Very cool. We should do more of this. Yeah, I think so. You know? In fact, you know, I I think that at some point, you know, we should. Uh, just my personal opinion here, but I think that Channel Nine would would benefit a lot from having a podcast feed of the videos along with the videos, so that yes. if I, if I you know, don't have time to sit and watch. I mean, for example, I just watched the Bill G, the yeah. Bill Gates interview, yeah. which I thought was really great. Uh -huh. But as I as I started to listen to it, I put the window down at the bottom, and I was just listening to it because there wasn't. You know, it was nice to see Bill. Well, that's but, because you're in Microsoft Podcasting World headquarters. You're a podcaster. Well, that and just you kidding. know, and you had other things to. Well, do. I had other things to do, and Good you know, point. you know, I, I've I've met Bill on and off over the course of the last you know twenty some years, so I know what Bill looks like. Yeah, you know, it wasn't something that I was compelled to 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 watch. I'm I mean, the, the you know, the the uh, video about the guy who drew that poster around Mix mm -hmm. that was really fascinating to see how he got all the shading and all these different things and what he used. That was a compelling video. Hard to do that as a podcast. Exactly. Can't do that one as a podcast. <laughs> so, but I think that an awful lot of the, the Channel 9 stuff could yeah. easily be delivered just as audio in addition to the video so that I could listen to it in the car on the way to work. Which actually, I mean, I have to say, it brings up an interesting point. For example, in certain situations where you have a, like, so you mentioned the video uh, on, on Channel 9 to have podcasts, and we could easily write a tool that mm -hmm. could take all of our videos and extract all the audio out of them and we'd still create MP3 and WMA. Right. That's not a, a hard software problem. Right. The problem is, in certain cases, for example, having uh, somebody up at the whiteboard drawing out the architecture for Hypervisor, right. for example, won't work really on a podcast. Because no, you won't have any context to what the person's talking about. Right, and that's and that's true. Yeah. So maybe not everyone would be a perfect translation, but on the other hand, yeah. just the ability to get it and say, "Oh, now I need to go watch that video." Okay, good point. You know, I, even if I can't, even if I can't see it, I mean, you know, we have a, an internal program here at Microsoft where we produce uh, audio content and deliver it to our uh, our field uh, consultants and sales force. Okay, and you know, so we we've been doing this kind of thing for a while, but that's a sort of big budget produces a a real CD, not even a recordable CD, a pressed CD on kind of a monthly basis, and you know, there's a lot of value in that. But I think that that uh, a lot of, of our customers, you know, the people that watch Channel Nine, you know, would like to be able to have this stuff in podcast format so they could listen to it while they're doing something else and say, okay, now I need to go watch that video. Excellent. So uh, earlier you stated you got into podcasting because of music, right? So can you talk about that? Sure. I, I've been a a musician since I was five years old when I started playing the piano. Uh -huh. And uh, 
when I was about 13, I picked up the guitar and started also doing drums. And so I, I, I like to say, maybe not uh, in a virtuoso fashion, that I can play anything you don't have to blow through or bow. Excellent. So drums, keyboards, guitars, and that sort of thing. And I've just really, really enjoyed since about 1975 making my own multi-track recordings. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I, one of my hobbies. I, I do that just because it's fun. Like the podcasting song that we heard at the beginning of this video yeah. was something that I did. I heard a, I saw a, a show on a PBS called The Persuaders, and they were talking about how marketing is doing everything from putting logos on the apples on the tree and all these different things. And, and I was big into podcasting at that point. It, was, it had only been about three months old. I mean, when I started, there were 12. Mm -hmm. About that time, there were about 400. Now I think there's like eight or 9,000. I'm not sure exactly what the current directory count is, but it's just exploding everywhere because now people can say, oh, you know, if I have one of those little iRiver devices with a microphone, I can just, you know, sit in my bedroom and talk, 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 plug it in my computer, pff, publish a podcast. Excellent. It's that simple. So, I mean, there's everything from 13-year-old kids in their, uh, you know, in their bedrooms talking about you know, what went on in school that day to mm -hmm. people like Adam Curry, who used to be a, a, a VJ uh, on MTV when it first started and has the whole radio program shtick down. Mm -hmm. You know, to people like Dave Weiner, who do things every once in a while while he's driving around in his car. Excellent. So it's you know it's, it runs all over the place in different levels of, of production quality, but it's just it's a it's fun you know mm -hmm. everybody's always wanted to be a DJ and go and now the top ten hit of this week is yeah whatever excellent and uh, you know I, and now I, you I, I never yeah exactly you know I never went to any school of broadcasting but I've heard enough broadcasters in my life to know how to do the voice up and down the scale it looks like it <laughs> so can you on camera do the way you do the introduction to Buzzcast? So people can see uh, it. Sure. Can you do that on the spot? Yeah. Right. I mean, you know the yeah. buzz cast, buzz cast, <laughs> and there's the music that goes along with sure. it. So well, cool. Well, I just wanted people to have a visual of that. Well, let's see. I think I, I, might, even, I might even have the uh, the music here. Let's see. There are things people can do. I had created something recently. Um, podcast themes. There we go. Buzzcast, Buzzcast, perfect. Buzzcast, Buzzcast. <laughs> and then I often, then I say, you know, hi, I'm your host, Michael Lehman, and this is the Mix06 PDC Microsoft World Podcasting Headquarters Buzzcast. And the, the music fades down, and, you know, so I, I wrote that theme, and uh, along with a few others that we use on these, on these podcasts. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, just for fun, because it's just a lot of fun to be able to create brand new music. Excellent. And, and of course, you know, I did that, uh, uh, the one thing we did for PDC, the front page of Channel 9. Yes. And I don't know if, if everybody is uh, is aware that that entire song yeah. is all me. I played all the instruments, I did all the voices. Excellent. You know, it's the first thing I've ever done that's had 200,000 downloads. Amazing. So it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. In fact, we actually did the entire song, but for licensing reasons and other things, we didn't. We didn't put the entire audio in there, and I don't know if that audio will ever escape into the wild, but we had fun, you know, parodying the entire lyrics of the entire song by the time so we get So why, there. What, what happened? Like, why, uh... Well, in order it, to, for sort of fair use rights with um, um, a, a parody, you know, it was decided that we could use a little bit of the song, but not completely do the entire song, because then we would have had to solve the same problem that all podcasters have to when they include you know, professionally recorded music, uh, you've got to have a, a performance license for it, and you know the whole uh, the RIAA and the performance rights organizations, which are uh, BMI, CSAC, and ASCAP, mm -hmm. are all working on trying to figure out what kind of a license works for being able to uh, play music. I mean, if you go into a, a a bar and they're playing music, they have to have a license with one of those performing rights organizations for all the music they play in the bar. If they're playing. You know, wow. Johnny Mitchell or the Eagles or ACDC, they've got to have a, a, a perform, performing rights uh, license. I mean, a lot of them are uh, sign up with BMI so they can play BMI music and they pay a, a fat, flat monthly fee. A fat, flat monthly fee. Wow, I never realized that. So yeah, if you go so to a bar, the music you're hearing or, or a tavern, uh -huh. that's, they, that's, that's a licensed... Uh... Well, it's not a licensed thing. They have a, a license for to be able to play like any BMI music and they pay a monthly fee for it. Wow. And in some cases they actually have to keep track of what they play. 
because some of that actually goes out, to, that money goes to the artist. I mean, if I'm a recording artist and I create a real live professional recording and I want to sell it at Tower Records or on iTunes or whatever, uh -huh. you know, I not only copyright the music and the recording, but I also sign up with one of these performing rights organizations so that I can get paid if it's ever played on the radio. So there's, there's two kinds of ways you get paid. You get paid a mechanical license for any time somebody actually buys a CD. And then you get paid a royalty for the performance if somebody plays it on the radio. Excellent. And you can even get a publishing uh, royalty if somebody prints it as sheet music and sells it. Okay. So it's, it's a huge infrastructure that's evolved since the late 1890s about, about music production. And of course it all got blown away by Napster and now it's, they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. But, you know... You know, it's it's uh, kind of all over the map, but yeah, there's there's a whole complex series of legal things you have to deal with mm -hmm. if you're going to, um, you know, use copyrighted music in a podcast. Which is why there's actually this whole thing called PodSafe music, where uh -huh. individual artists have said anybody can use this in a podcast. Some say you can use it in a podcast as long as you give attribution. You tell somebody that hey, that was my song. Okay. So in fact, it's become a really big deal for independent artists. To have a podcast feed so that they can showcase their songs. That's a very interesting point. Excellent. Without having to go through the Yeah, you don't have to have a record deal, you don't have to have a record label, and you know, if you start to create a buzz around so you your could band. Create, you could create a whole album of just podcasts. Oh, absolutely. And I could just go download your music via RSS. Right. Uh, and if I produce right a song every week, right, exactly. So now why aren't why not just have why doesn't Napster or uh, any other companies like that simply have RSS feeds for their for music. You subscribe, you pay X amount of dollars a month, and you choose what artist genre you're interested in, and you don't have to think about it. You simply just plug in your device, and then RS via RSS, the you know the wonders of RSS. Right. Um, you simply plug your device in, and you get all the new stuff, right? And you get any you, you, so because that would be nice. You know, I don't have an iPod, I have whatever else they're called. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice not to have to think, you know, to hunt and pack and search for music. Right. Here's what here's the kind of music I like. Right. Well, I Fuck th me I th up. I think that's coming. Okay. You know, it, it shouldn't be a software problem. No, I mean, it takes well, RSS right. and and WMA and MP and file. And whatever 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 syncing mechanism you want to use. I mean, Napster, especially the whole Napster's to go thing does seem like a, a real natural for that. I'm not sure why they don't do it. Okay. You know, iTunes doesn't do it because they want to sell you the music. And Napster wants to sell you some bits of it. But sure. an awful lot of these flat rate subscription services like uh, Napster and Yahoo Music and, yeah. uh, and things like that, you know, I think that that would, that would make a great deal of sense. And, I don't, and I'm sure they must have plans I'm sure uh, they moving do. forward with that. Cool. But, I mean, and the, but you know, there's really two pieces to it. The RSS piece is what allows you to subscribe and get the files down. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have a syncing mechanism like the uh, the mechanism that's built into Windows Media Player or the mechanism that's built into iTunes sure. for synchronizing the stuff that you've got onto your device. Absolutely, in your library and actually goes out and calls. Right. Or they could use Indigo and push it onto your device. No? No. Nah, I mean, it was, Indigo, Indigo be, you know, could be used for some of the RSS stuff. In fact, okay. you know, some of the things that I'm looking forward to in the near-term future is some of the technology that's going to be out there in Windows Vista and IE7, yeah. uh, you know all the RSS things that Microsoft has been announcing. Uh -huh. We're going to have a, a development platform there for being able to build, you know, very very easy. Uh, so know, the RSS R platform actually will support synchronization. Yes, well, I mean the, the RSS platform supports the synchronization from the HTTP server where the music is stored to your uh, machine. To it your doesn't library. So, doesn't support yeah, the synchronization from your library to your device yeah. is the subject of whatever software, media player, or uh, iTunes, or whatever that knows about your device. Absolutely. But most of these, most of the, what are called the pod catchers, the software that actually downloads the okay. RSS feeds, know how to actually take the, the files and put them in the proper hierarchy inside media player or iTunes so that when you're ready to synchronize, you know, it'll do that automatically. Excellent. Well, this has been fun, Michael. Yeah, it's yeah. a, you know, Microsoft World Podcasting Headquarters. Well, you know, we, we, we try to keep things interesting around here. This is an interesting point. What if we took you around on all of our interviews and you brought your mic and your portable your portable uh, podcasting machine? Right. That way we wouldn't have to, to worry about writing software to create podcasts for the... So you could we could introduce the video and you could say, Hey, you know, it's Michael Lemur. 
All right, you could do the, the, the introductions, and then uh, we'd have the video and we'd have the podcast done at the same time. I'm well, just kidding, yes, of course. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the time management <laughs> chat would absolutely love me to take on that additional responsibility. Sure. But, but well, you know, I, Mike? We can talk to him. Yeah, yeah. But I am going to be doing that uh, at uh, Mix 06. So for anybody that's going to be at Mix 06, which if you haven't registered yet, do it because it's going to be very cool in Vegas yeah. for three days. Yeah. Uh, I'll be there with my portable podcasting thing, you know, trying to find out, actually having conversations with people who are there to see what they think. Excellent. And I think it's going to be a real interesting thing because it's, it's so different than anything we've, we've done in the past. I mean, Bill's going to give a keynote with no PowerPoint slides. Yeah. You know, we were having presentations by a lot of different third parties who are participating in this. It's more like a blogger con than it is like uh, a trade show. Sure. And obviously we're going to come and talk about all the, the cool stuff we're doing because yeah. that's, that's part of the deal. But there's going to be a lot of other people, some announced, some not yet announced, who are going to be coming to talk about their stuff as well. So There's also going to be some very cool um, different kind of activities uh, or places for attendees to go and hang out and learn and teach as cool. well. And that's something that I'm working on with Hans Hoogley. Oh, right, right. And, uh, so that's going to be different this year. So, so maybe we'll get us on the Mix 06 Buzzcast. Yeah, there, there we go. There we go. <laughs> get me and Hans on there to pitch that. That's right. We'll talk about it anyway. We don't really pitch. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, you know, the, all the Mix 06 things are really just to try to tell people what's going to be there so they can make that decision as to whether they should attend or not. So. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. This is, is this the first time we've had you on Channel 9? On no, I, I, I was on, uh, Scoble did an interview with me not quite a year ago about the Shareware Starter Kit. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, it's the first time I've been on since then. Okay. And uh, and this know. is definitely the first time on Channel Nine that we've ever videoed and podcasted at the same time. That's right. <laughs> this should I talk is, like that? This is a <laughs> podcast. Yes. Yes. So when we publish this, there'll be a uh, podcast feed for this as well, and we'll put it in uh, in the podcast section on Channel Nine. Yes. And. Uh, you know? you know, I actually, I kind of like that. That's pretty interesting. We'll have to do this again. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. And there are there are other people within Microsoft who are doing podcasting. Uh, and, you know, there are uh, a lot of different ways in which, not only what Microsoft is doing, but a lot of companies are doing to try to figure out how to leverage this to really communicate. Uh -huh. Because, you know, the whole idea is I can really express this stuff. I can get excited. I can tell you, God dang it, you've got to do it now. Yeah. Exactly. And it's very hard to do that in text without typing it in all caps. Excellent point. Excellent so, point. Just imagine if every Scoble post was a podcast. Oh, man. It would be very interesting. <laughs> exactly. Uh, on that note. All right. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. You take care, Michael. You betcha.